Good evening, everyone, and um, um, thank you for being here on this uh, cold uh, winter night. Um, thank you to the Victorian Fabians for the um, staging of this really important discussion, and it's good to get that sense of history in terms of where you've been and um, really try to nut out both the why and where and um, now, now the what. Um, can I too um, echo the acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land, uh, the Kulin Nation on which uh, we're meeting tonight and pay my respects to their elders um, past and present. Um, and I don't do that lightly. I think um, I've got great ad admiration for the resilience and the strength of our Indigenous brothers and sisters. And they're, in my mind, community members who've experienced disadvantage and keep rising above it. And like many other groups, disadvantaged groups that Labor has delivered tangible reforms for, they, I guess most of all, um, in my mind, know that neoliberalism neo hasn't and never will address the structural and systemic change that they need to allow them to be full participants of our society. Neoliberalism or the conservative gov governments that espouse them don't create social reforms like Medicare and the NDIS to maximise access to health care or social supports. It's Labor governments that do that. Conservative governments don't open new schools or create equitable funding systems. It's Labor governments that do that. Nor do they create new jobs nor deliver equal pay for women or government funded paid parental leave. They expect the market to take care of that. It's Labor governments that do that. Conservative governments don't ensure a more level playing field or deliver native title. Labor governments do that. What neoliberalism and the conservative governments do do is give the impression of making things work, make of that, that neoliberalism makes things work logically, like the trickle down effect. They make us think that low company taxes will lead to companies employing more people with their increased profit. They pick on the most vulnerable, blaming people receiving the dole for welfare um, scapegoating. They believe in small government and don't get the social contract that needs to exist in any society. Conservative governments harness the concerns and the fears they're hearing, but they don't have the capacity, the commitment, care or the crafted solutions to deliver outcomes through slogging away the long process of social reform. Reforms that require that require that we bring the majority of the Australian people with us. Dealing with neoliberalism is nothing new for the ALP. Discussion on neoliberalism has, however, traditionally focused on the Liberal Party, but most recently we've seen One Nation um, as a new populist version of them. And we've seen One Nation blame refugees for our population density, our transport and housing difficulties. And Labor really does need to redouble its efforts on job creation, education pathways, to address the economic in inequality, which is at the root of some of those concerns. And it's one of the reasons that people have become attracted to populist neoliberals like One Nation. The loss of the blue collar vote has impacted Labor's ability to form government. The working class vote has been Labor's traditional base, but it's drifted away as these voters have not felt that Labor has been prioritising new jobs for those affected by the decline of manufacturing. Working class voters form a big block of those attracted to conservative populist movements. These should be Labor people, people who rely on government services, people who rely on the next shortened Labor government to reverse the impending penalty rate cut. However, these are people that have, haven't felt that Labor in government has repaid their faith and their trust and hope in Labor. They've regarded Labor as being distracted by internal disunity under the Rudd-Gillard years, notwithstanding major achievements like NDIS, Gonski 1.0 and paid parental leave. They've seen the Labor government cut the single parent benefit, which further disadvantages vulnerable families. They've felt Labor's focus on the inevitability of globalisation and important human rights or environmental reforms has come at the expense of a focus on themselves. The economy is changing and unskilled jobs are declining. Naturally, this does worry Australians with limited education and career prospects the people of refugee and migrant background that I work with, as well as those who want good jobs for their kids. These are our supporters, Labor people. However, there are Australians who don't believe that politics can deliver. However, these are Australians who don't believe that politics can deliver positive change or that public policy is relevant to their lives. People who feel that their concerns are outside the understanding of political parties, that involvement in politics doesn't solve their problems. These should be Labor's people too. Labor needs to ensure that people are seen as standing for the right things. It's a moral task of renewing our ideas and our sense of purpose. If you care about the education and healthcare you receive, the public transport that you ride in, the air that you breathe, you have to participate in the public debate. 
we all know, particularly in this room, that if we don't engage in politics, you end up being governed by vested interests, by powerful privileged voices. As we've discovered with Trump, powerful privileged voices, which can also be found in populist movements, presenting themselves as outside the swamp or on the margins of our society. One Nation, Trump, and the other populist parties are our lesson in this matter. They're also seen as taking on Labor's former role of strong interventionists, but with a neoliberal rent. Inequality, redistribution, taxation, immigration are all important topics, and I'll touch on these in a moment when I talk about One Nation. But at its core, what's import more important is that the ALP attend to the root causes of economic inequality, which is what leads to people looking for a scapegoat, and hence communicates more broadly about both its short and long-term priorities, particularly for this group, a group of people in our society who look to government for a safety net, and most importantly, look to Labor governments in times of uncertainty when we know that neoliberalism isn't working. Many commentators have talked to, about how in both Britain's decision to leave the EU and Trump's election as US president, the decisive factor in creating the majority of referendum or the electoral college votes was the desertion of voters in economically hard hit working class regions from the centre left party, which they used to support. Such centre left parties need to return to their focus on jobs and economic inequality. Daniel Andrews' government, I believe, is a case in point about how you can do both human rights reforms as well as tending to the bread and butter issues of education, jobs, health and community safety. The Andrews government is praised for introducing legislation to give same-sex people equal adoption rights, pushing to legalise medicinal cannabis, establishing the country's first Royal Commission into Family Violence and committing to appoint women to half of all senior legal and government board positions. Premier Andrews is also seen as looking out for those most in need, the retrenched and unemployed, kids who want to pursue trades or TAFE, disadvantaged families seeking services or supports and for whom investments in education, jobs, health and community safety make such a big lifelong impact. Providing lifelong learning from starting from kindergarten, building through primary and secondary schooling and leading to wide access to vocational training. Investing in long neg neglected hospitals like the one announced in, yes in the recent budget, Western Hospital in Footscray and Northern Hospital in Epping. Establishing a migrant worker centre in recognition of the disenfranchised and exploited group needing extra support, the people that get left behind from neoliberalism. The fact that the very belated introduction of some very basic public health care to America is one of the very first things which Trump is trying to ab abolish indicates that his claimed concern for ordinary people is selective and fraudulent. And he can't really claim to represent the working class for whom such safety nets are so important. Prior to being a senator, Doug Cameron was AMW's secretary and he was arguing against federal Labor's love affair with the free market. This particular point he made in a speech was very telling. You have to look at the social problems it causes. You have to look at the pain and the hurt and the suffering for ordinary working people who will never be brain surgeons, who will never be computer scientists, who might never enter the knowledge nation, but simply want decent jobs on a production line or doing maintenance in a factory in Australia. This union knew that not all low-income workers had managed to graduate to McMansions. Their jobs were being shipped overseas and they've seen lots of manufacturing jobs disappear around them for, their, for themselves and family and friends. Since the year 2000, over 150 manufacturing jobs have been lost in Australia. This country is losing 10,000 full-time jobs every month and they're, be, they're being replaced by insecure work, work that is open to exploitation and abuse. I say that not to hold on to the past, but to recognise the impact on working class people for whom that's not just an entry job, but a lifelong job. Minor parties like One Nation have exploited the in insecurity this has caused and thrown and throw in some xenophobia and mixed, mixed it into a frenzy of racism and anti-major party sentiment. We need to resist the temptation to respond with a social frame, but instead use an economic frame, but not an, a neoliberal economic frame. So how does the progressive left respond if you're concerned or affronted by findings around Hanson's racism resonating with people, such as the results of the EMC survey where 50% of the population supported a ban on Muslim migration here in Australia. How do you tell half the population that they're wrong? As Peter Lewis from EMC Communications who conducted the survey said, the one thing that I've learned in more than 20 years around politics is that convincing people that they're wrong is a zero sum game. Look at climate change, hitting deniers with facts just harden their positions, creating a false equivalence of two sides to the story when there was only ever one. Entering into a battle for hearts and minds is even trickier. 
it is impossible to convince someone that what they feel is wrong because feelings aren't right or wrong. They're the product of a complex mix of reasoning, emotion and lived experiences that are both deeply personal and co collective at the same time. At the centre of politics is the challenge to understand what is driving people who hold different views, to work with them from the source to win their trust. Hanson's support is part of a global trend in cu cultural isolation. Trump's wall, the Brexit, where economic disengagement and re rejection of globalisation cast the Muslim as outsider. Be they in a burqa, in an ISIS video or in a boat, they become the symbol of things that have gone too far. The common thread through UK, US and Australian societies is a rising sense of economic security, insecurity. A sense that the deal we thought we had struck with our society has been broken. In Western democracies, that deal has been pretty consistent for more than a century. Work hard, pay your taxes and you'll have a steady job, access to health and education and a decent quality of life when you're older. That is the social contract that centre-left parties must hold on to as their mantra and get right first. After that, the electorate tends to give them leeway on other matters. Another essential report showed that one quarter of voters expected their, expect their jobs to be less secure in the next two years, while just one third expect to be working with the same employer in five years' time. This lack of job security undermines everything certain about someone's life. Their ability to plan for the future, invest in their home, support their kids. And what's even more interesting is the disconnect between those who are regarded as the elites and the rest of the population and reasons behind this growing insecurity. While the political insiders see rising in insecurity as a natural consequence of technology and our economic affluence, the majority of Australians see it as the outcome of conscious decisions made by their leaders. Someone feeling insecure does not cheer for free trade deals or see the spread of labour hire and contracting out as a way to reduce costs and make businesses more productive. They endure these decisions and then they, when they're personally affected, they resent them. When they learn that half of all the Australian companies earning more than 100 million per year have found a legal way to pay no tax at all, they don't marvel at their smart tax advice, they're filled with righteous ind ind indignation. And if they were to stumble across a report showing levels of inequality in Australian society were rising, it would merely confirm their suspicions that globalisation and neoliberalism have gone too far. And if politicians can't bring back the manufacturing industry or guarantee wage rises, at least they can do something symbolic, like turn back the boats or build a wall or ban Muslim immigrants. That's the real truth about, political out about the political outsiders who are attracting an increasing share of the vote with every election. Whether they are Green or One Nation or Xenophon or Hinch, they're not making these things up. So there is a progressive political agenda that can res resonate with all these disengaged and distrustful people, while at the same time taking the heat out of their fear and insecurity. And it's about such unfashionable ideas as in income redistribution to reduce economic inequality, workplace bargaining rights in this new era of more and more casualised labour, industry development to cater for people across different education levels and corporate responsibility to ensure greater tax equity. That's a political challenge to responding to Hanson and her supporters, as well as the other side. Not to call them names that make us feel superior, but to listen and harness their sense of protest to more constructive ends. The effects of neoliberalism have eroded worker security and social safety nets. The severe links between productivity and wage growth and exorably increase both the economic and social inequality in our society. Australia will always need Labor governments, Labor reforms and Labor vision because neoliberal governments, movements and, conservative, and the conservative governments that they create don't create the social reforms, safety nets or feed people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.